All right, let's keep going. All right, so software testing is very important uh, component of every product that you see out there when we talk about, you know, global standard, you know, type of product. Uh, software testing um, is not something that we can skip. It's very important. Um, and so um, I try to incorporate that into the training as well, make sure that I can, ha you know, rehash on a couple of things for you guys so that when you start a project, you are doing something, when somebody say testing QA stuff, it's not going to be something that will take you by surprise and say, now I don't know anything about testing, right? Very important. Um, in the course of your in line with your duty and your responsibility as well, there are days and times that, you know, you could be wearing the, the hat, you could be wearing the, you know, the hat of a, um, you could, you, you, you could also be wearing the hat of a, a, a um, like a QA, you'll be, do, you be doing the QA work as well, in addition to your role as maybe product owner, a BA or something. And again, as a matter of fact, even if you are a product owner, product manager, et cetera, and testing and quality in, in all, in a nutshell, it's, it's a res so responsible of everybody in the organization, right? I think the last time that we met, I, I, I started with that. You know, quality, keep in mind. I want you guys to keep this in mind forever. Quality is the responsibility of everyone, right? But of course, we have a dedicated team, you know, um, quality assurance engineers who are responsible for, um, you know, doing this, you know, doing all the testing, uh, ensuring that, you know, the product that we ship out there, they are bug free, they are defect free, et cetera, right? But, um, Quality is supposed to be, you know, um, the responsibility of everyone within a, um, you know, company, within the organization. And so if you guys watch the video, um, I talked through software testing, uh, method to check whether the actual software product matches the expected requirement and to ensure that software products is what defect free. I know I talk about all these things, SDLC. So just as we have the SDLC, that the software development life cycle, uh, same thing, we have the STLC as well for software testing, and that is a software testing life cycle, right? So um, the series of activities carried out by testers um, methodologically to test your software product. So the kind of thing that they do, uh, the actions and, you know, the types of testing executed to make sure that at the end of the day, uh, where we arrive, you know, uh, you know, we will have something that is of, high quality for customers. And of course, not just high quality, but we will deliver something uh, or we will give customers something that will deliver, you know, uh, great customer satisfaction, um, you know, for them, right? So it's very important. Um, why software testing? Uh, if you watch the video, I think I, you know, talk about a couple of things in here. Uh, what are the benefits of software testing is in here, cost effective security, you know, product quality as well, and then customer satisfaction, very important, right? So keep this in mind, um, this for um, uh, the cost effectiveness, very important. There are certain things that we can avoid, right? You know, we can avoid by just, you know, um, doing testing and a whole lot of testing um, before the product goes to the market. Then, you know, we take it out there and then, uh, we happen to have, uh, you know, have a glitch in there that will cost us several millions of dollars, right? Very important. Um, security, same thing, you know, um, product quality and then customer satisfaction. So all these are very important. Testing artifacts, right? Once you go into testing, uh, test plan document, test strategy, test cases, test script, bug report, traceability metrics, certifications, and a whole lot more. This is just a handful of the things that, you know, we consider um, as artifacts, right? You know, some of the things that, you know, will be your, like, your deliverables, you know, to the team. So I listed, uh, I listed a handful of uh, this uh, stuff right here. Very, very important, right? Um, I think somebody who... Um, somebody started last week or something that... I, I have to share some, you know, test case template and not that alone, but I shared um, test guide, um, you know, test, you know, strategy and test plan 
uh, documentation and tell um, you know so, some other template like that because he he has to guide. I think he needs to guide somebody, um, a new QA, somebody from the data analyst team who is now coming into their team as a um, a QA or something like that. So he, he needed to guide you know this individual. So you see, this is going to come up. So if you have to guide somebody, right, you know exactly what you do. <laughs> it's going to come up a lot. You 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 will have to guide somebody. You will have to train somebody, right? And so he he was training her as as the new QA for the for you know for their team. And so just imagine if you don't have any prior you know um, knowledge when it comes to you know testing effort, right? It would have been a disaster. But of course that is why the training. I uh, dedicate some time to talk about all these things so that, you know, again, you're not surprised um, at all. You'll be, you'll be well armed and well equipped, you know, well equipped enough to take anybody through this and, you know, um, teach somebody, coach and mentor a new person, you know, come into your team as a QA, et cetera, and what, you know, your expectations are that they're supposed to be able to do. So very important, you know, test plan is very different. Test strategy, test cases, et cetera, test scripts, you know, if you, you're writing code and doing some level of some little level of automation in there um, as well. Uh, so we talk about test plan in here. Uh, we talk about content of a test plan document. I put this out here deliberately. It's very intentional. I just want you guys to see. And if I happen to share some of this test plan document with you guys starting a project. You will see some of these things that I've highlighted here um, in some of this document as well. Um, test strategy is here. Uh, what's the difference between test strategy and the test plan? So a test plan is a document that describes the scope, the objective, the weight on software testing tax, whereas a test strategy describes how testing needs to be done, right? Um, a test plan is used at the project level, whereas the test strategy is used at the organizational or organization level, right? As you guys can see here, test plan has the primary goal of how to test, when the tests and who will verify, whereas test strategy has a primary um, goal of what technique to follow and which module to check, right? So over here, you know, clean cut, simple, straightforward, you know, um, the, 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 the bottom line or the, the line between um, test strategy and what a test plan is. Um, and then uh, test case document, very, very important documentation. Um, there are applications that, you know, um, if the company, they have budget, they have money to do this, they usually you know, go for this type of tools that are out there, you know, like um, the um, HP ALM and test reels and other um, enterprise tools that are out there like that. You know, if you buy the license, you, you buy, you know, the, the um, you know, the tool, you know, you have the same test case, um, you know, in there, you know, you'll be able to manage your testing effort properly as well. But again, not every company, you know, uh, will have the budget, you know, for an enterprise to like that. Some of them can be very like ridiculously expensive, right? But again, you can use a test, uh, you can use like a spreadsheet, just like you guys use a spreadsheet. Um, do the same kind of work, but using a spreadsheet is somewhat, somewhat tedious and very cumbersome. If you're using a tool, it's very easy, um, um, very easy, very, um, simple as well. So test case is a specification of the input execution conditions, uh, testing procedure, and expected results that define a single test to be executed to achieve a particular software test objective, right? Such as the exercise, uh, as a particular program path, or to verify compliance with a specific requirement, right? So as the business gives us, you know, the they tell us, hey, we want this product, this feature, et cetera, um, in there. I hope everybody's here. Uh, I, can, I was hearing some sound that some, somebody dropped off or something. Let me check. Okay. Um, anyway, let's, let's keep going. 
So as a business, give us, you know, a mandate, say, hey, we want this feature delivered, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, and then the feature gets developed. We need to be able to um, double check, you know, cross check and make sure that, you know, uh, whatever the business is asking for um, is exactly what, you know, we are getting ready to deliver to them as well. You know, just matching um, the actual results against the expected, you know, um, results. And so that is very, very important. So that's what basically test case document is all about. Uh, I know you guys have done, you guys have done one or two exercises or assignments, and maybe there are maybe two more assignments to be done. And I, I think when that is done, I'm confident that um, when you guys, if you guys are, if you are placed on a project or put on a project anywhere, you massacre it, for, you know, for me, right? You do justice to it. So maybe after this class or this session, maybe after tomorrow's session, you know, I will, I will post the next test case assignment for you guys to uh, finish up with that one. And after that, I know that, you know, you guys will be successful. You, 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 you guys will be successful anywhere you find yourself, right? Because after about four exercises in test case documentation or test case, you know, writing, I mean, um, I expect nothing but, you know, I expect you guys to try, right? Very important. Um, so yeah, there's a test case document. You guys already had a sample of the Gmail. Uh, I was teaching somebody uh, way back, some years back on, you know, QA stuff. Uh, test case document content as well. You guys watch the video, it's in here. Types of testing. So there are functional testing, non-functional testing and maintenance, you know, type of testings as well. So um, functional testing, we have unit testing, right? I told you guys before, unit testing is what executed by developers, right? So after you uh, write your code, you compile your code and, you know, it's on your local machine, et cetera, you gotta do unit testing. You gotta be able to check yourself. Don't just write certain things and just believe that you know, everything that you've done is correct. You know, it looks good, there are no bugs, et cetera. You're not gonna have, you know, errors, you know. You need to be able to compile your code and see how, you know, things are looking. So that's unit testing, right? A lot of times, you know, people just, just do whatever they like and check it in and they, then, you know, it's all full of bugs and then they have to go and, you know, um, you know, real work again. Um, so that is very, very, um, very, very important. So functional testing, smoke, you know, we have smoke testing is UAT. UAT is same as what well, user acceptance testing as well. Uh, we have localization, globalization, temporability, et cetera. They are all under what functional testing, right? UAT, let me rehash a little bit on UAT. So UAT is user acceptance testing. So before the product goes to the market, right? Very important. I know I may have said this in the video, but you know, um, let me, uh, you know, permit me to you know, re-echo on this again. Um, you, it is very important, right? So um, we, we get to share with the business, you know, what has been done and then um, for them to also sort of give their uh, concurrence on it and say, oh, okay, well, it looks good, et cetera. So there are two types of, you know, UAT, right? And I think I've, I've said this before in some other session with you guys, uh, we have the alpha and then we have the beta testing, right? The alpha testing is what is done on site that is within the organization. And then the beta session, um, the beta type is what, you know, we usually, you know, deploy that application software or whatever to, you know, specific region, specific people, for them to have a hands-on. <laughs> and so when they start using it, we'll be gathering data, right? When they start using it, there's going to be times that the software, the application is going to crash. There's, there's going to be a lot of them, right? So as they begin, they, they, they use it, we, we are analyzing what is coming in, we're looking at it, we're looking at the locks, et cetera. And then we say, oh, okay, hmm, why, why, did, why did this happen? Why did this, what, you know, <laughs> did that happen? So we'll be looking at all these logs and they'll be like, okay, well, and then we'll be correcting it. That's the most important thing here. Once we're analyzing the logs, analyzing what is coming in, et cetera, why people are testing their hands on. I know, I show you guys, maybe not this much, um, WhatsApp, you know, WhatsApp app. Um, I know you guys use the web version a lot in Ghana. Um, yeah, we have the web version. Uh, previously, you could not, you know, like 
um, if you have four devices, if you have four devices, one and four device, multiple devices, you couldn't, you, you, it was not possible for you to have your um, WhatsApp, uh, you know, r running, you know, actively on all these four devices. But I think uh, a couple of months ago, they deployed like a beta version where they were testing this as well. And I think they, they, they're still even doing that. Um, I don't know whether you guys have tried that, you know, on maybe four devices, but I've tried that on four devices. I have a lot of devices and I have, you know, maybe WhatsApp running on it. On this MacBook that I use, there's a WhatsApp running on my phone. Definitely there's a WhatsApp running on my cell phone. And other devices that are here that are WhatsApp running on it. And so they are testing, they are, you know, currently, you know, testing the beta version. Um, they have, I think the, the limit is on four devices, right? So uh, by this time, um, they are, you know, gathering data, analyzing all the logs, all the data that is coming in, how people are using it, all the crashes, and they are fixing the issues, right? That is a, the whole point of it. Uh, that it will give us the ability to fix all the issues. You know, we don't just want to, you know, trust uh, what we, we have done and say that because it's, our, it's done in our environment and our engin engineers are good, that is it. We trust that they have done a good job. No. We want actual users, actual customers to use this different locations under different conditions, et cetera, different devices, you know, different versions of devices and different, you know, uh, specs of laptops and cell phones, et cetera, so that, you know, we can, we can have a proper um, simulation then, right? So this is very important. UAT, very, very important. And then, of course, the alpha version or the alpha type of testing within UAT is when we actually let you know members of our operations team within the company. They also get to have a hands on on the application, and then also give us feedback as well. Also very important, you know, we give them the test data, um, some test account, etc., and then they start testing, and then they will be they will share their you know feedback also with us. So UAT is very important. Non-functional testing. We talk about performance, load testing. Um, um, endurance, volume, scalability, and all this. And I think I maybe elaborated on some of these things in the video, so I'm not going to um, talk that much here. Let's keep going, all right? And then types of testing over here. So many different types of testing over here. I could list, uh, I just listed just this half, half of this few here, yeah. all right? And I gave you guys the Gmail um, um, sample test case, um, so spreadsheet to use for your exercises. So that's good. All right, let's start with this. I believe that this is gonna be the starting point from the video that I shared, right? All right, is, is that it guys? Uh, I need a confirmation here. Is that it guys? Um, the video ended here. So let's start from here. Okay, all right, I see who say yes, all right. Um, I see somebody saying that uh, it's just being on the network today. Um, um, is that is that the same for everybody? Everybody's having issues with this uh, Zoom. Oh, this is just um, one of. Oh, Salim is saying yes. Recently saw that feature. Okay, all right. Okay, 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 okay. All right, so um, categories of testing, right? So we have testing um, manually and then we have automation as well, right? Um, automation is fun, it's exciting as well. Manual is also the same thing, you know, uh, manual testing. So this is a type of what? Software testing in which test cases are executed manually by a tester without using any automated tools. Guess what? You guys have already passed this stage. Why? You guys have already prepared test cases for uh, what was the exercise about? I think for assignment, you guys did prayer requests or something. And then uh, what was the other assignment? I've forgotten. Um, uh, uh, for the exactly. visa. Yeah, yeah, for the, you know, for the visa payment. Yeah. So guess what? You guys are already gurus here. You guys are the experts. I mean, you guys should be teaching me now, right? <laughs> you guys should be, you know, lecturing me now. <laughs> should be you guys should be teaching me now because by this time you know preparing a test case for visa payment you know uh, that's a global payment company you guys are gurus you guys are expert you know professionals right now you can go anywhere 
in the world and work with them, right? So uh, preparing test case for visa, pre requests, request, you guys are already there. So that is manual testing, right? The manual testing is type of testing in which test cases are executed. So you write the test cases, you look at your test cases, and then you begin to follow what the test case is telling you step by step, you know, what you should be looking out for. And then you execute it, you put your remarks or your comment in there, you put what has failed, what passed, et cetera. So you guys are already there, gurus, professionals, right? And then we have automated testing, right? So automated testing, it's not like the manual one way you actually write, you know, the, uh, you, 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 get to write, you get to have a test case. It's the same test case, but this time around it's not spreadsheet, et cetera. You write in maybe some few lines of Java, some few lines of code, C sharp, et cetera, um, um, in there, right? So automated testing is entirely writing code to test the application. Uh, we have Selenium, we have HPQTP, we have other tools. Uh, Selenium is actually an open source tool, right? It's an open source. Um, that means that there are no licenses required and there are no, um, you know, you don't have to pay, you know, for this. It's just some tools out there, open source. When we say open source, maybe I know my audience here, not everybody's a developer here, um, but when you say open source, that means, you know, you could actually get it for free, right? Without paying or doling out cash or, you know, paying for licensing, et cetera, right? So Selenium is there. There are other open source tools like that also out there for testing. Uh, but HP, you guys know HP, right? Hewlett <laughs> Packard. So HP is not for free. HP, you're going to charge you some license fee. There are other uh, tools out there as well for automation that you have to pay money also, right? <laughs> it's not for free. All right. So basically what I want to get out here is that there are manual testing and there are automation as well. If you guys decide, or if I put in a project that is solely, I've, I haven't done that, but Maybe it should. It, it could be an area that I, I, I can explore. Maybe the, uh, you know this year. Um, um, you know, it, it it could be. Well, you know, let me not say much. <laughs> I know you guys are gurus now. Whatever you guys get on, you guys will just get it done, right? All right. Let's talk about box defect, right? Today, that is going to be what we we will be essentially be talking about. Let's talk about bugs. Let's talk about defect. I know we've been talking about it, you know, uh, bugs is what the, the reason why we have testing, right? If you are testing and there are no bugs, then that means there are no testing essentially being done. And so bugs are critical. So um, let's talk about bugs here. A bug, a software bug uh, is an error, a flaw, or fault in a computer program or a system that causes it to produce an incorrect or unexpected results or to behave in unintended ways, right? That is what a bug, I'm taking one more time. I think I love the definition. A bug is an error, a flaw, a fault in a computer program, right? Or system that causes it to produce what an incorrect or unexpected what result and to behave in an un un unintended ways. This is very simple, it's self-explanatory, right, as well, because I mean, it's, uh, everything has been rehashed in here, right? It's a fault, it's a flaw, that's not what we're expecting it to, uh, we're expecting this application to behave. So if we see something that is, you know, um, not expected, that is a bug. If you look at an application and it's not behaving as suspected, you know that's a bug. If you look at something it's not opening properly, um, you know, uh, there's a, be a, a weird behavior on the platform, that's a bug, right? So a software bug could be something as menial as misaligned image on a landing page, right? So don't take small things for granted, right? Yeah, if you go on a platform and the image has shifted a little bit, it's not, there are some alignment issues. Uh, the image are not properly aligned. Something is not looking good. You got to write a bug for that. It has to be corrected. That's what we call a bug, right? Um, so misaligned image on the landing page, 
or as serious as a mobile apps spontaneously, you know, crashing, right? That's a bug as well. So there you have it. Um, if you wanted to know what at all we're talking about here when we say a bug or defect, there you have it, guys. All right. So we've seen um, software development life cycle. We've seen software testing life cycle. A bug also, uh, when it comes to defect or bug, we have also a cycle as well, life cycle as well, right? So let's take a look at a defect life cycle. Well, because when you are, say when you're in quality assurance, right? And then when you um, discover a bug, they will have to go through a process, right? An entire life cycle, and then you close it when finally that, that bug gets fixed, right? And so let's, you know, um, take a journey um, here. So a different life cycle, a bug or life cycle in software testing is a specific set, set of states that defect or a bug goes through in its entire life, right? The purpose of defect life cycle is to easily coordinate and communicate current status of defect which changes to various assignees and make the defect fixing process systematic and efficient, right? Very simple and straightforward. So uh, there's gonna be um, the, the purpose of the defect life cycle is to easily coordinate what? Coordinate and communicate the current statuses um, of, the, of, the, of the defect which changes, right? As they fix this, it will change as they fix it. And if it's still there, you know, the bag is still, you know, visible. You still have to report it again, it has to be fixed. So all the status change and all the things, the changes, you know, various assignees, that is all part of the life cycle of the defect, right? The fixing process. So typically this is what you see as you guys can see over here, there's a, a little process flow diagram over here that sort of you know shows us or you know tell a story with you know the life cycle here. So from the from the top, right? Let's start from the top. From the top, you guys see new, right? New. So when you you find a bug, um, obviously the very first um, status is going to be what? It's going to be new, right? It's going to be new. And then once you open it up, it has to be assigned. So the next step is what? Assign. So you got to, you got, you got to assign it somebody to fix it, right? And then it comes down to open. Now, when it comes down to open, you guys see that there's a, a right arrow by the open side. I know Zoom, I can use a pen, something to indicate here. Um, I hope you guys are following. On the right side, there's an arrow pointing over there. You guys see a couple of things in there. Uh, duplicate, rejected, deferred, and not a bug, right? So as the bug gets open, the person that you assign it to will look at it and say, oh, this is actually a duplicate. Why? Maybe, just maybe, right? They already, they've already seen, um, this bug, or there's already an existing ticket, um, like a you know, like a Jira ticket that has been created, a bug ticket that has been created already, and they're already working on that, right? So we could reject it here at this stage of open and say, oh, this is a duplicate of something that already exists that we've already seen that we're already working on, right? At the same time, we could also reject it, right? We could reject it because we'll say that, oh no, you know. This is this this feature um, is working as expected, you know. Um, so no worries, no issues here, right? At the same time, and I have explanations on on the next slide, you know, talk about all these things. At the same time, we could have it as what well, deferred. Deferred means that well, this is a little bit complicated, right? We could say that well, yes, this is an issue. This is not good news, but. With this, uh, with with a you know time that we have here, that we really want to go into production. Well, this issue does not really directly impact on our product, but it is something that we're supposed to look at, 
And so um, we will take a look at this maybe in the next sprint, right? We'll take a look at this in the in, in in the you know the the you know next sprint. We don't necessarily have to waste time um, in fixing this, right? And so that 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 could also happen. And then we have the not a bug at all. Sometimes too, it could be that you know this feature is is really what the stakeholder said that we they wanted to see. Um, so it's not a bug; it's part of the feature. And that's okay, right? But when it gets open, the flow here is that the next step is fixed. Um, Joshua is on, right? Yeah, okay, he's on, okay. The flow here from open means it goes here, the next one is fixed, right? And then when it gets fixed, um, the next step is what? Pending rate test. Pending rate test here simply means that um, yes, you have fixed this issue. So let's say, um, you know, Salim is the one that fixed this issue and then reassign it to maybe William, right? And then um, maybe William is busy working on it, you know, testing on something else. And he's yet to um, test on that issue that has been fixed. So it could be pending rate test, right, at this point. And so when he actually grabs that issue now and then begin to look at it, that is when we move into rate test. As you guys can see on the rate test side as well, on the left side, we have reopened. So that means that in the course of rate testing as well, we could potentially see the same issue again. And then we'll have to reopen this same issue again. So as you guys can see, it says reopen, it goes all the way up to open. Let me see in the chat box that you guys are following this flow here. Say a yes, yes, let me know you guys are following what I'm saying. You guys are with me so far. Okay, so everybody's with me. So pending rate test and then it gets actually rate tested. And then the issue can be what? Be reopened again. Why? Because the bag still exists, right? So William still look at it and say, yes, you know, well, you say you fixed it, but I can still see this thing. It's still crashing. The page is not opening. There's still a bug in there. So you need to fix this issue again, right? So it gets reopened and come back to open again, again at the top and it flows in the same sequence again, right? It'll come down again to open, fix, pending retest. So same thing. Maybe on the second attempt, right? On the second try, on the second try, maybe when it comes to rate test, this time around, William is going to pass it and say, well, now it looks good now. It's working as expected. And so what does William do? William will now push it to the next flow, which is going to be verified. And then the next flow is what closed. He's going to close the issue and say, yes, this issue has been fixed, right? So this is the bug, a typical bug or defect life cycle, right? You open up the issue, you assign the issue to the developer to somebody who work on it, and the, that person, you know, will fix the issue. The issue gets fixed, um, and then they move to the flow of, you know, pending retest, and then actually get retested, you know, retest, and then it could be reopened. Oh, if it's verified, it's clean, it's working as expected, you can match the actual versus expectation, and move on to what? Verify, right? And then we move on to what? Close. That is a simple bug um, life cycle over here. So here you have the, all the definitions here, all the things that we're talking about, you know, in the previous page. The new, what does a new mean? When a new defect is logged and posted for the first time, it is assigned a status as what new, right? Assign. Once the bug is posted by the tester, the lead of the tester approves the bug and assigns the bug to a development team. This does not happen all the time. Let me sound a word of caution here. Um, sometimes, you know, you could be part of a big team where there's a lead tester, there's uh, even QA manager, etc., all involved. But, sometimes too, it's just all you, right? 
the team is not that large, not that big. Yeah, it's just you guys. And you, when you find something, you just assign it to the developer. You don't really need a lead tester to approve it first, right? It's not necessary, right? But again, sometimes it can happen. So keep that in mind, guys. And then open. The developer start analyzing and works on the defect fix, right? Open it up. And then fixed. Actually, the problem gets fixed, right? When a developer makes the necessary code change, and verifies the change, he or she can make the back status as what well, fix. So you can change it, um, the status. Oh, I'm not sitting by that computer. If I was sitting by, if I was, you know, sitting by, uh, I'm not by that computer today. If I was sitting by it, I would have shown you guys, uh, maybe the Azure DevOps board that I showed you guys the last time, right? I would have shown you guys a bug issue that gets fixed. And then I could have maybe gone, gone ahead to, you know, change the status to close, and then we, we you guys will see this in actual play, right? Um, maybe next time I'm sitting somewhere today, not by not by that computer at all. Um, so fix, um, yep, you know the issue is, is done. Pending retest, right? In the bug life cycle, pending retest. So once the defect is fixed. Um, uh, is fixed by a developer. Um, once the defect is fixed, the developer gives a particular code for retesting the code to the tester. Um, since the software testing remains pending from the uh, on the tester side, the status assigned what pending what retest, right? So he will push the code again to the QA environment. I hope you guys remember the environment again because all that we're talking about here today, we are talking about developers environment, QA environment, you know, you guys remember we talk about environment, that was like in your first uh, um, week, you know, sessions, right? Talk about, you know, the dev, QA, UAT or staging, and then, you know, production environment. I talk about this in, in some of your, you know, um, first or second week video, I believe. Uh, I hope so. Yep. So all that we are talking about here is code being promoted. You know, the code is being promoted to a uh, different environment, et cetera, right? Pending rate test, right? And then rate test here, tester does the rate testing of the code at this stage to check whether the defect is fixed by the developer or not, right? And then changes the status to what? Rate test, right? And then once it's get done, it's verified, uh, we say that issue has been resolved. There's a status that we use uh, I see it very common among different companies as well, resolve. And then finally, um, they put close and then the issue get closed completely, right? So just a little definitions here for you guys. So when you see something, but no, again, you guys are all expert and professionals here. I believe you guys, right? I have a lot of confidence in you guys, uh, but I just want, I know you guys know some of these things all by now, but I just wanted to throw it out here, right? And then the other types of definitions that you guys um, saw as well. So verified, right? This is a definition continuation. So verified means what? The tester retests the bug after it got fixed by the developer. If there is no bug detect, you know, detected in the software, then the bug is fixed and the status um, assigned this time around is what? Verified, right? And then we have reopen. You guys saw the reopen, right? If the bug persists, even after the developer has fixed the bug, right, the tester changes the status to what? Reopen. Once again, the bug goes through the life cycle. So as I show you guys in the um, in the in the flow, the little flow diagram here, you know, it goes back again to open, and then it will flow back again through the um, life cycle again, right? Um, so that's reopen. Close. If the bug is no longer um, as this, then the tester assigned the status close, right? You guys saw the duplicate, rejected, deferred, etc. So duplicate, what does it mean, right? If the defect is repeated twice, the defect corresponds to the same concept of the bug. The status is changed to what duplicate. Is it well? This this already exists. We've seen it before. We've seen it again. Um, Rejected. If the developer feels that the defect is not a genuine 
uh, defect, then it changes the defect to what rejected, right? They can reject it and say, no, this is not really, you know, um, this this is not, you know, really a bug. And sometimes, you know, this is going to happen a lot too, right? You know, you will find a bug and the developer might say, no, this is not a bug. It, it's just not, it's we're working as expected, you know, you know, it, it's not, it's not, it's not, it's not a defect, right? And the, the, the person might reject it. Deferred, right? If the present bug is not of a prime priority, right? Like I mentioned, right? If the present bug is not of a prime priority, and if it is expected to get fixed in the next release, right? Then what happened? The status deferred is assigned to such bugs as well, right? So if you will look at it and say, well, you know, um, this is, yes, this is an issue. We all can admit, uh, we all can admit that this is an issue. But again, if we don't fix this today, you know, it's not going to be a showstopper for us. That does not stop us from going to uh, production with this feature, right? This can be fixed later on because it does not maybe directly, like I said, impact on this feature that we're shipping out today, right? But yes, it's a good call. We'll find something that, you know, we need to fix. So we will fix it, but not in this iteration, right? Not in this current iteration. So it's very important. Keep that in mind, guys. And the last one here, um, not a bug. So if it does not affect the functionality of the application, then the status assigned uh, to a bug is not a bug, right? So you may see something that, you know, it does not affect the functionality of the application. It, it's not, we, you cannot match actual results against expected results, then it, ha it has no place in there, right? So very important in there. I hope you guys are following so far. All right, let's keep going, guys. Let's keep going. Okay, I see yes from um, Iman Lobby. I see yes from, from Reed, um, Gideon. All right. So now you guys are gurus, you know, experts, professionals right now. You guys should be successful anywhere, you know. Okay, all right. Let's move on. So this is the same bug life cycle, so explained in a different way, right? Again, you guys are welcome to watch the video and then, you know, take notes again, you know, again, uh, <laughs> this thing is like faith, right? Faith Bible says that faith coming by hearing and hearing the word of God, right? So um, it is not good enough to watch and listen to me once. You got to watch it again, 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 again. That's how you know, you get grounded, right? <laughs> so just uh, listening once is not enough. Watch it again, 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 and then something's gonna say, you know, sink in and say, ah, I didn't hear this one. Okay, all right. So same thing, same different life cycle is playing different ways, right? Um, um, maybe this time around, it's even elaborated more, right? You know, we have, we have elaborated on it um, over here very well. So you're welcome to look at it again, but it's gonna be important. All right, now let's look at the bug report. This is gonna be a bug report. So now that you find a bug, right? You find a bug and you know, you find it, you have issues in here. How do you report it, right? How does it, the issue get reported? This is very important. The objective is that we want to discover, we want to be able to find all the flaws, all the errors in the application before our customers find it. It's going to be embarrassing, right? <laughs> it's going to be, it's going to be very embarrassing. It's going to be embarrassing that we will not find the issues. You know, they've hired us to, you know, find all these issues first, and we don't find it, and the customers will actually find it and report it, right? That's 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 a shame, right? So so that's the objective of you know doing all these things. So when we find a bug, actually, what what happened? How do we report it, right? So this is an example of a bug report, right? Now that well, we were testing, we were looking out for a bug. Now that we've seen one, how do we uh, report it? So 
I'm going to be talking about a couple of things out here, but you know, really in a back report, three things is very important, right? I'll rehash on the three and I'll go ahead and talk about all these things out here as well. So in a bag, in a typical bag report, um, three things, right? Number one, um, the steps to reproduce it. Number two is the severity. And then number three is, you know, priority as well, right? So the three, the steps to reproduce it is what? How will anybody, you know, if I wanted to see the same bag, replicate the issue, right? If I wanted to reproduce the same issue, how do I do it? So step number one, you say, Number one, go here. Number two, navigate here. Number three, go to this uh, tab. You know, there's this menu, go here. So it's just like giving somebody a GPS, a direction on to, to where exactly to locate that issue, right? That is what the steps to replicate the issue, the steps to reproduce the issue. Every bad report, you must have this in there, right? Even if you don't have any of the things that are here, I'm telling you guys, the three critical things that you must see in the back of it. And quote me anywhere, right? <laughs> if you're having to build a project and you're showing them you know, the correct you know, ways of doing things then, you know, be sure to you know, uh, re you know, rehash on some of these things. They'll say, yeah, you, you, know, you actually know what you're talking about, right? So number one is what? The steps to replicate the issue, the steps to reproduce the issue. We need to be able to reproduce it. Um, you just seeing it is not just enough. Everybody should be able to also see the same issue, right? If it is indeed a problem, if it's indeed an issue, then everybody is a platform, it's on a platform and we are all accessing the same platform. So why can't I also replicate it, right? If it happens to me, it's gonna happen for the customer. And so that's the reason why we need to fix it. So how do I replicate the issue and then we fix this issue, right? So number one, move the three critical um, component or what we must see in a bug report or a defect report. One, steps to reproduce it. And then number two is what? Severity, right? Now, um, severity is very important. Severity simply means that how bad does this bug affect the platform, right? How bad, you know, how bad? It is just a designation. You know, it could be high, it could be major, it could be minor, it could be medium, it could be whatever. Severity simply gives us an indication how, you know, um, this issue really affects this platform, right? That's severity. And then priority is also very important. Priority simply means, you know, in what order should we fix this? How, what is the agency we should attach to this, right? How important is it for us to fix this, you know, like right now? You know, in what order should we fix this? That's priority. So number one, steps to reproduce it. Number two, severity. And then number three, priority, right? In what order we should fix this. But again, let's go run through some of these things out here. Very important. You, you will see it in HP, ALM, and other tools that are out there. Again, if you guys don't have the budget, the company does not have the tools like that, you know, you, you got to be able to write a bag report. And of course, that's what I'm showing over here. So that if you are writing a bad report, you know exactly what you, you, you know, you turn it over to the team, right? So typically a bad, um, well, well, a bad report, you see some of these categories in there, right? So you see the category bug ID, where you have the ID number, you know, the name, the reporter, the bug report date, et cetera, right? So it's gonna, it's, it's gonna generate something, you know, you can have an, uh, you know, some bag ID in there. And then the name, the name here of this bag or this issue is login, um, unable to log in, right? Keep it very simple. It's not complicated. Um, who's reporting this? The name is there. Um, what is, to, you know, today's date, right? So 9 2020 right? And then what's a summary? You got to be able to give a description of the bag, right? The description, summary. So login failures, right? When the correct username, and password is entered, login keeps failing, right? Where the URL, where, what kind of environment are we seeing this? It could be in QA, could be in wherever, right? But you gotta be able to put that URL in there so you guys can see. In evidence, you know, do you have any evidence? It could be a video, it could be a screenshot, whatever, attach it to it, you know, make sure you have, you know, the video, screenshot, whatever, anything to help you know, communicate um, the bug properly, 
um, they will go ahead and do it. It could be a video, you could record, you could have a screenshot. It's okay, right? Platform, you know, is there. The operating system, uh, the browser, you know, um, it could be happening. This this issue can be, you know, can be seen in Chrome, it can be seen in Safari, et cetera. Put it out there that maybe you tested in all these um, browsers and, you know, you thought it was maybe just one browser issue, but actually you can replicate this in Chrome, Safari and whatnot, maybe Mozilla or whatever, right? And then when it comes to bug details, steps to reproduce it, right? You guys can see it. steps to reproduce the bug. So number one is what? Go to HTTPS, bluevoyant-testing.com. Maybe that's a testing environment, right? And then once you go over there, maybe it's going to prompt you to enter the valid username and password, right? So number two, enter valid username and password. Number three, step number three here, account page should load successfully displaying all account details and products, right? Okay, expected results. You just should log in successfully and have landing page displayed account details and product, but what is the actual result that we're seeing here? And that's the reason for this bug report. Actual results, login fails, right? And this is a critical uh, issue. If you cannot log in, I mean, that means you cannot, you know, um, you know, get anywhere, right? Basically, if you cannot log in, that is a showstopper. So as you guys can see from the severity here, um, major, right? So this is a critical issue. We need to fix it ASAP, right? ASAP. And so um, assigned to who? Maybe Rocky, you know, this might be assigned to, it's assigned to Rocky. Um, he's the one that's supposed to fix it, right? And the priority to this is what? High, man. We cannot have this as what? Low, medium, or anything. This is very high, right? If customers cannot log in, I mean, we can we cannot get ahead. We can't do anything else, right? Almost like a showstopper. So again, steps to reproduce it, the severity, and then what? Priority as well, right? And then you can have additional notes, whatever, whatever, also right here. If you have additional comments, you can put in. So this was tested in both QA and staging environment, and still you were able to see this same issue, right? Yeah, in the comment, you want to put in additional notes for, you know, to help it, whoever is going to be replicating the issue, um, you know, to do, to do it right, right. So this is an example of a bug report. Let me see in the chat box. I don't have to repeat this again. Let me see chat box that you guys are following what I have just. So Reed says, yeah. Um, Samuel Clote says, yes. Um, Joseph says, yes. Salim says, yes. Iman Labi, yes, sir. Joshua, yes. Okay, Penelope, Isaac, okay. All right, so everybody's following. Okay, all right, just to make sure that I am not talking to myself, uh, audience, right? <laughs> um, okay, all right. So that's a typical bug report, right? Very important. You see this come up, come up, you know. So if you hear bug report, don't be surprised. Don't panic. Don't freeze out and say, ah, what am I, how am I going to do this? If somebody say, well, then you create a bug. When you're creating a bug, make sure you have these details in there. Don't panic, know exactly what you, you, you know, you, 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 you got to show the person your skills, right? <laughs> you got to show your person your skills. All right. So it looks like we've come to the end of um, testing. Let's take a quick uh, one minute break, get some water to drink, and then we're going into the next hour with change management. All right, so everybody get a water to drink. You can get up, stretch, do whatever. And then we're going into chain management. So we have 60 seconds. All right. Really saying that <laughs> I was going to do a pop quiz. <laughs> no, no pop quiz today, but yeah, well, expect it in a day, right? It's always a read. <laughs> Pop quiz. <laughs> All 
All right, so, so we have about maybe 50 seconds more. So get some water, whatever, and then we'll take off here with change management. All right, guys. Um, let's keep going. So change management, change management. You guys have heard about it, we've talked about it, uh, et cetera, today. Let's get into change management, right? So, um, as, as we build uh, products, as, you know, as a team, sometimes, you know, we'll be in the middle of um, working on something and then, you know, we'll have to change course sometimes right we got to change the approach or change um you know change one you know one or two things um in there and say well it, it could be as a result of several factors right it could be maybe you know market um trend has changed you know you could be doing something invested money uh building something that you realize that the competition or the market trend has changed and so you guys have to change something or it could be just um, the um, business, you know, changing calls and saying that, well, uh, we initially we wanted to build this feature, but we want to change it and do something else. So you want to have something else come in. Come in. Um, and so um, in, in our 
you know, a typical type of space in our environment. Um, there's going to be a lot of changes that, you know, you might encounter. Um, change is always good, but we have to manage change uh, properly, right? We got to manage change. Other than that, um, we're going to have people every day saying that they want to change something. And that will stall the, the, you know, the project. We don't want to do that. We don't want to be, you know, authorizing and allowing people just anyhow to make changes to different things. Everybody, you know, everybody got some opinion in the, in the room. And so if every day we're going to listen to somebody, every day somebody's coming out with a new idea, guess what? We will never ship out anything. And so this is the reason why we need to have a proper change management process in there, right? So pretty much change control process in software engineering. Um, you know, what is change control? Change control is the process that a company used to document, number one, right? Identify and authorize changes to an IT environment, right? It reduces the chances of an authorized alteration, right? You know, disruption and errors in the system, right? Very important. Um, so number one, chain control is a process that a company used to what? Number one, document. Number two, identify. And number three, uh, authorize changes to an IT environment, right? And what this does is that it reduces what? Um, the chances of unauthorized alteration, disruption, and errors in the system. Like I said, if every morning somebody's going to come up with something else and say, we, we should change this, we should do this, no, it, it's not going to be, we're going to be introducing, we're going to be disrupting, you know, disrupting our environment. There's going to be errors every day on authorized alterations to, you know, the features that we are building, it, it, we will never finish anything, right? And so this is the reason why, yes, change is okay, um, but number one, we need to document it. Who is asking for this change, you know? We gotta identify the change itself and then authorize the change that, okay, we need approval on this change, right? So that's why we have this change management process in there, very important. So here is some basic, you know, um, steps that you are likely to see um, in the change management process. So number one is the change request. You know, typically you will see the change request come in. That's number one. Number two is impact analysis, right? So this change that we are, somebody say that we, we should have this change or a request has come in. How does this impact on our, maybe already existing platform, right? So how does this impact, impact analysis? Number two is approval or rejection. After the impact analysis is done, we could either reject it or it can be approved as well, right? Number four, change implementation. If it gets approved, we go ahead and you know implement a change and we move on. And then the fifth step in here is reviewing and reporting change. So once it's done now, you know, we go back, we review what has been changed, uh, you know, and then make a report on it as well. But let's talk about some few things out here, why this um, change control or the management of the change is very important, right? So whenever a new or, or different changes are requested for the system, especially by stakeholders, right? Is neither, so this, this word here, very important, right? It's, it's, it is just like, um, um, I talk about um, scope script, right? When a requirement is changing, you know, it's the same thing. Yeah. So when a stakeholder say they want something changed, it is not an optional, no, something that you can ignore as well, right? Stakeholder is the one that is asking you to build this. <laughs> so you cannot say that, no, we can't change this. We, don't, we, can, we're not doing, we, we, we will not do this, right? No, it has to be that because we don't build platforms 
in isolation. We are not building it for ourselves. We're building it from the stick for, for the stakeholder, right? And you guys remember the user stories, right? We say stories are what written from the perspective of the what the end user, right? So if the end user is the one that is asking us to build this, and then you say no, then you know who are you building it for? <laughs> you gotta ask yourself that question. So, especially from stakeholders, when they ask you that something has to be changed. It is not an optional, number one. Number two, it's not something that we can ignore. We cannot just overlook it and say, nah, okay, well, you know, they come back every day. No, we cannot ignore what they're asking for. We got to sit down with them, ask them questions, and then, you know, have what they are asking for done. So it has to be what implemented without affecting other components of the system, right? So we, because we, it's not an optional and we cannot ignore it, we need to implement the change, but we got to do it in a way and a fashion such that it will not have, you know, there are consequences or impact, negative impact on the, of the platform. So this is why or this when chain control comes in handy, right? So it helps the project team to modify the scope of their project using specified controls and policies, right? So chain control is practice whenever a project is not progressing as planned, right? Sometimes because of the project, you know, we will come back and sit down as a team and we say, okay, well, we need to change our approach. We need to change this feature. Let's add more additional feature, whatever to it. Uh, and the reason why this is very important, I think I've said it over and over here, um, because when you add additional features, guess what is gonna happen? Number one, we might need additional time. It's going to prolong the project, right? When you 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 know, um, we're asking for more time, or we adding new features, or we are changing um, our approach. Definitely, something's going to happen to our timeline, right? Our schedule. So the project can be prolonged. Um, we will need additional budget because you know time is money. Um, Someone has to approve of all these things for us. This is why the change management process is very important. So it is a, a mandatory, uh, it, it is mandatory that, you know, a formal document for um, change requests is completed and reviewed in order to keep control of change requests, right? Very important. So we need to document it. We just, we will not just listen to it, you know, um, somebody just saying it, no. We need to document A and B and C is what you are looking for, is what you want to add. You've already communicated A to us. You want to change this feature and say now, okay, well, for this maybe money remittance feature, we want to now add additional thing to it, right? Mobile money, you know, we want to add additional feature to our mobile money, you know, feature over here. Well, it's okay, but we just have to document it to make sure that it's properly being reviewed, you know. And then number of question, what am I encounter while analyzing the change control? Like who will approve the change? So there are certain things that, you know, we need to have all these things done, right? Who is gonna approve this? Does it require us to run a change control board? Sometimes too, you can have a board. You can have a change, change management board. You guys might see it as well, right? we have change management board. The change management board is the one that will review some of these um, new requests, et cetera. And then they can either reject it or approve it, right? Very important. And then of course, like I said, how much time is gonna require, you know, to either research or implement the change, right? So you will not just say today and then tomorrow we are doing it, no, right? We need to review it, we need to, um, look into it critical and say, well, it's okay for us to authorize this change. Or let's, no, let's reject it. No, it's not important. This is not important here, right? What are the impacts of the changes to other component of the system? Um, so this is very important. You know, like I said, schedule, cost, resources, they are here as well. Is there any threshold under which the project management can approve it? So it could be working with a budget, et cetera, you know? And so they do not want to balloon 
or you know skyrocket you know this budget you know through the roof they want to keep it you know through you know to a certain minimal so it's very important so this is why um the management of change is very important right change control um is very very important here so just as we we had you know the bag life cycle um change control process also you know we can have a, a little life cycle here as well right very simple and straightforward so number one is the change request identification we got to be able to um, have a request come in uh, to identify a need for a change right very important that's number one um number two is for us to be able to review the change right do impact analysis right so assessment so change request assessment number one that's number two here and of course on the right side you guys see um there's something out there reject or defer change request so you can at this number two stage you could either reject it or defer it right um so once we, we look at the assessment, the change request assessment, we could promote it to change request analysis, right? Change request analysis. And then change request, ap request approval. And in all the three steps, step two, three, and four, we could still be rejecting it or we can defer it, you know, still at this stage. And then finally, we can approve it and say, okay, let's go ahead and implement this, you know, the said, you know, change that we want, right? Very important. Um, these are a couple of factors out here, uh, factors that change control should consider, right? So there are steps, a little bit of steps in here, steps in change control process, and then the um, set of actions that should be taken as well, right? So let's start from the top. Let's read through some of these things, um, you guys. Can go back to the video, you know, watch it again um, as well. So, change requests in um, initiation and control. Um, so, what kind of actions are, what kind of things are done here? So, request for change should be standardized and subject to management review. Change requesters should be kept informed as well. And then, number two is what the impact uh, assessment. So what do we do at impact assessment? We make sure that, that all required or make sure that all the requests for change are assessed in a structured way for analyzing possible impact, right? We make sure that you know all requests for change are assessed in a structured way for analyzing possible impact. And the third step here is control and documentation of the changes. So number one is the change log should be maintained. That tells the date, person details who made the changes and the changes to be implemented, right? So we will not just say that, well, we were in a meeting and uh, Peter said this and James said this and we went ahead to implement. No, we got to keep a log, right? We got to document this. Um, the date should be on there, person, details, who made the changes, et cetera, who's asking for a change. We need to document, document every step out of the way, right? Put information down. Um, and then only, only authorized individual should be able to make changes, right? So in a typical project, um, let, let's use the, you know, the church project as an example, right? You guys are the church project, you know, from the start, right? You, you guys do remember that, you know, the church project, right? You guys do remember the church project. Yeah, I know you guys do. So let's say on the, on the, you know, uh, we were, you know, with the church project, right? Um, mm -hmm. As you guys are discussing what, what should come on the platform for the church, etc., even a church member can, if they have access to the meeting and different members that are part of the stakeholders, you know, whatever, 
anybody can say anything at a different time and say, yeah, yeah, can we have this? Can we have that? Can we change this? Can we do this? Right? But if that is going to be done, if we will listen, we'll have to listen to everybody, that's going to be a problem, right? So at the beginning of the change, at the beginning of the project, sometimes it's very important to have this change, you know, committee or change management board established, right? You know, at the begin at the kick of the project, so that you know, um, if there's going to be change in the future, we need to take a different turn or different approach, add something else. You know, somebody don't don't like it, don't like what they see. It needs to come from the right channel, the right person, right? So it's very important that at the beginning of the, the project, we will establish that as well and say, hey. If you guys happen to ch make changes, it's okay. We will welcome it. You know, when the requirement gets changed, it's okay. We don't have a problem. But we need to make sure that who is going to be the go-to person who will authorize this change, right? It's not everybody. We will not entertain um, authorization of change from anyone. We need specific people. So if maybe... Um, all the members of maybe executive members of the church or something, executive board members or whatever, they can do it fine. So that's fair. If specific people, one or two people within the board, they, they are the only people, the individuals that can authorize the change. Great, fantastic, right? So we need we need to have that. So only authorized individual should be able to make changes to the platform. We don't want anybody to go to bed, dream, and come back in the morning and say, well. For the church platform, you know, can we have this? Can we have that? You know, you know, can we have you know STC um, integration on the platform so people can book their bus trip? <laughs> That's a very wild, you know, um, request. But somebody can dream and bring something, some idea that they are thinking about this. Can we have this done? No. We need to have specific people to authorize it and say, yes, we can have that change. Because guess what? It's going to impact on a lot of things, the cost, resources, schedule, et cetera, right? So, um, and of course, if there should be a process for rolling back to the previous version. Um, she wants to be identified, you know? If we decide to go route maybe K and then Things, things, you know, it doesn't work well so well as expected. There should be a roll, like a rollback, you know, um, um, point in there, so that we can always roll back and say, yeah, this is where we got to, and you know, let's come back. You know, it's not going to help us as well. Documentation and procedures, right? Documentation, documentation and procedures. Um, since you know Reed was Reed was asking me about you know pop quiz, now it's beginning to come in my mind a lot. Why 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 are you doing that to me, Reed? <laughs> now, since Reed, Reed, Reed asks about like a pop quiz, I'm now I'm now beginning to think about it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Documentation and procedures, guys. So whenever system changes are implemented, the procedures and associated document should be updated, you know, um, accordingly. So it's very important. So whoever is authorizing the chain, that is not our problem, but we got to make sure that we have traceability, right? By traceability, that means we need uh, documentation done so that we can always trace back and say, yes, on this date, um, August 24th, December 18th, December 11th, right? December 7th. Um, James is the one that I requested for this and it was authorized by uh, ABCD here on this date as well. So documentation, right? We got to be able to have certain time. Yes, there might be some sometimes instances that maybe circumstances or conditions might not, you know, um, you know, prevailing uh, conditions uh, might not necessarily help us to go through all this process, but we need something critically done, you know, emergency. We can do it, 
yes, it's going to come up sometime. But whilst we do it, or somebody gives their verbal, oral approval, um, somebody, their manager, senior person will give their, say, yes, let's just go ahead and do it. He's going to do that. He's going to authorize it. But we got to make sure that after when that is done, we document it as well, right? It's very important that we document it after the facts, after it's done. Because it was an emergency situation. And emergency situation, let's say customers are unable to log in, something is failing, and we know there's a big problem, right? We come back in the morning at work, and there's something crazy going on, right? We don't have time to go to all these change management process steps, et cetera, before something gets changed or affected or something. Somebody will just give a verbal uh, or a approval, uh, authorization. Hey, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's, let's go ahead and get this done this way, right? But we need to document it so that, you know, we can always go back. So documentation and procedures, right? Very important. Authorized maintenance. System access right should be controlled to avert unauthorized access, right? So, um, of course, we don't we don't want everybody to have access to just anything, right? So, system access right should be controlled um, so that not just every, every, anyone could be making changes to um, anything within our system on our main panel or whatever that might be, right? In the back end now systems whatever uh, very important testing and user sign off right um software should be uh, thoroughly tested we should be able to have you know good qa organization set up they know our qa organization should know exactly what they're supposed to do anytime any day anywhere right very important and then we have the version control right version control um Control should be placed on production source code to make sure that um, that only the latest version is updated. Emergency changes, right? Uh, that's, that, that was what I was talking about, um, as emergency changes. So a verbal authorization should be obtained and the change should be documented as soon as possible. That was what I was referring to, right? So yeah, there could be some instances or a situation that we're not going to be able to have time to go through all this treatment process. That's an emergency situation, right? But again, when it's all done, we're supposed to have it documented so that you know we'll, we'll have something to refer to in the future. We can always go back and say, "Yeah, this is what we did. This is what happened," and you know, um, this is it. So we have steps for change control as well. So we talk about some of these things. Number one, change request identification. Um, so that's number one. So what you guys remember on the um, on the the cycle or the step, the five steps in there for change change management. The first one is well, change request identification, right? So identify the need for a change and describe it on the project change request form, right? There's a project change request form. And then number two is what change request assessment. So, so number one is if the change is now valid, it has to be deferred or rejected. Uh, determine appropriate resources required to analyze the change request. Perform quick assessment of the potential impact and update the change request form. At this stage, reject change can request. Change request should, should stop, right? Um, change request analysis. So for analysis, assign the change request to an authorized member. Deferred change, re-enter this analysis step. Um, at this stage, rejected change requests should stop as well. Um, change request approval. So number one is identify change works uh, complexity level before approval. Um, Identify the impact level of the change before approval. Uh, review impact of change request to authorize person for approval. And at this stage, reject change request should be stopped as well, right? Change request implementation, that's a final step here. 
um, update project, you know, procedure, management plans, inform about the change to the team, monitor progress of change requests, record the completion of change requests, and then close change requests, right? So the approval for change control may be done by a project manager, lead IT, lead developer, stakeholder. So that's something that you guys are supposed to keep in mind. Um, so uh, we talk about chain management. We use the words in interchangeably, uh, chain control, chain management, but maybe there's a different level of difference in there. So chain management is a responsible, is, it is responsible for what managing and controlling change requests to effect changes to the IT infrastructure or any aspect of IT services to minimize risks of disruption of services and promoting business benefit. Chain control here includes activities like the submission of the recording, analyzing, approval of the chain to improve the overall performance of the system. So basically the set of activities that are done as a control methodology here. And then, you know, um, the overall high level management is what we see up there as well. All right. Um, yeah, we're not gonna get into decision table today. Um, so yeah, um, how are we doing with time? Oh, okay. We actually have some 20, 20 minutes here. Okay. All right. So I'm going to stop the live streaming and then um, see if you guys have questions on the QA side up to this side and then we'll call it a day and then tomorrow we'll continue.